Joel, good to have you with us. We had you Thank on you. a little over a year ago, but since then you've come out with a new book called The Big Secret, and this follows another book that you had. Why uh, two books for investor advice? Couldn't you get it all in the first book, which was called The Little Book That Beats the Market? Well, it's, it's not even as good as that. This is really my third book. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, I wrote a book uh, six years ago called the, uh, the Little Book That Beats the Market, and it really gave a very simple way for people to, to beat the market. I actually ended up, uh, after I finished the book, getting worried that people would kind of uh, screw it up, and I was really trying to help people. So, and there aren't great data sources and everything else, so we actually set up a website to do everything for them. Uh, except that I made a little mistake. It, it actually ended up being pretty hard. I tried doing it with my kids uh, and managing a portfolio of uh, 20 or 30 securities and keeping track of the taxes and everything else. It turns out most people don't, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to do it yourself, and I even found it hard with my own kids. So uh, I learned a lot. Uh, we did a lot of research since the first book and uh, uh, learned some more things and, and came out with something that I guess is even easier for people to do and also uh, takes advantage of our latest research. Now, uh, before we get to that, and you've got some new funds, uh, you maintain that an in the individual investor can beat the big guys, as you put it. How can that be? Well, it's, it's pretty interesting that from the research we did in the book. Um, most people know that uh, the typical index funds, the S&P 500 and the Russell 1000, uh, if you invest in those, uh, they beat most managers, roughly about 70% of the managers. Uh, and that's pretty powerful. It's because of their low fees and that most managers aren't really adding value. So one logical thing to do uh, would be to say, well, um, I know only 30% of the managers beat the typical index, so how do I find those guys? And it turns out if you look back over the last three, five, and 10 years of those managers' records, there's really no correlation between how they do in the next three, five, 10, which is really what you're trying to figure out. Uh, so that's why, you know, most, uh, you know, many, uh, at least advisors, have, have recommended, and, and possibly rightly, uh, that index funds for the individual investor who doesn't know how to pick stocks on their own is maybe a good uh, uh, opportunity for most people. So we set out to do something a little better. And as it turns out, the, the regular indexes, the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000, are seriously flawed, as it turns out. Even though they beat the most active managers, they're still very seriously flawed. And they do something that costs investors about 2% a year. Uh, and that really is is that uh, they're market cap weighted indexes, which means they put more weight into the Winners larger market caps. And, and so that if a stock... the losers. Right. So if you believe like Ben Graham or uh, Warren Buffett that you know, the market's sometimes emotional, it's not efficient like so, so many professors have professed over many years. It's not efficient. Uh, that means that if the market does get emotional over the short term, uh, that some stocks are overpriced and some are underpriced. And a market, uh, a market cap weighted index, uh, if a stock is overpriced, it buys too much of it automatically. And if it's underpriced, it buys too little of it automatically because it's based on market cap, which is essentially price. So it, it sounds crazy, but it, it actually is systematically doing the wrong thing at every point uh, whenever there's an inefficiently priced stock. And so there's an easy way to correct that. And uh, there are actually equally weighted indexes. Instead of putting, uh, putting more in the larger uh, market cap companies, it actually puts an equally weight. So if you have the S&P 500, it'll put as much weight in stock number one as it will in stock number 500. It still makes plenty of errors. In other words, it's an equally weighting. But those errors are now random, not systematic like a market cap weighted index. So you actually get back the 2% a year. Uh, and a few people have come out with something called fundamentally weighted indexes. It's just another way to weight stocks. Uh, w without using price, and therefore the errors in those indexes are also random, and you get back the 2% from those two. And since we're value investors and have been done a lot of research on value investing over a long period of time, we create an index that we call value-weighted, which just means the cheaper something is, the more weight we put into it. And it's actually more diversified than uh, you know, the S&P 500 or Russell 1000 index has the same volatility, has the same beta, yet uh, over the last 20 years you would earn 7% more a year uh, following that strategy. And it's, it's ridiculously simple. Just put more weight in the cheaper companies. Uh, before we get to that, you uh, make the point the reason why there is such opportunity for uh, the individual is that in the investor world, you believe it's become more short-term focused, which means buy high, sell low. That's a really great point. Uh, 
big picture is that uh, when you th when you look back at at what's happened over the last 20, 30 years, uh, there's been more access to information. There's been more computing power. There's been more people going onto Wall Street. You know, it's high-paid hedge funds and you know proliferation of mutual funds and and everything else. So there's a lot of smart people actually trying to beat the market, quote unquote. And so you would think that it would be getting tougher and tougher for individual investors to, to outperform the market. And what it turns out is our simple value factors have actually gotten stronger over the last 20, 30 years. And the reason for that is that the, the world has become much more institutionalized, meaning, um, I'll just tell a quick story I tell in the book, which was that uh, in the late 80s, I had uh, an investor in my partnership, uh, one of the first fund of funds. And these are... Uh, uh, funds that actually pick managers, and you're asking them to find their expertise to pick the best managers, and they put that all together in a fund. And so one of the first that was put together in the late 80s, or at least the ones I knew about, uh, asked to invest in our partnership. And at the time, I was writing quarterly letters, and, and that seemed to be fine for my investors. Uh, but the fund of funds said, well, we have to report more often, so could you give us monthly returns? So I said, sure, I'll, I'll tell you the monthly returns as, as they come in. And uh, sure enough, after the first month that uh, this fund had uh, money with us, uh, we reported back that we were up 1.1%, which we thought was pretty good. But I got a call from the uh, fund of funds and said, well, you know, we have a lot of other managers that do similar things to you, and the average one of those was up 1.2% last month. To what do you attribute your underperformance? And... Uh, I politely told uh, the fund of funds to call me back in a year. I probably should have told them to call me back in four or five years, but I don't think they would have stuck around uh, so long. So I figured I'd, I'd settle for one year. But the world has become much more institutionalized since then. Uh, people uh, look at daily returns, weekly returns, monthly returns. They get analysis over the month or the quarter. It's very hard to keep a long-term horizon when you're investing in the stock market. You know, four or five years is more, uh, a more reasonable time frame to judge anyone's uh, performance. And so you get hyperactivity, which research shows does not lead to better returns. Exactly. So what happens really is is that uh, you know if you underperformed in the last six months, year or two years, uh, people chase performance. So they take money out of you and and put it to someone else. And another statistic I wrote in the book, which I think is the most telling, is if you look at the top performers over the last decade, the top twenty five percent of managers that have uh, uh, outperformed came up with the best record for the last ten years. Uh, 97%, okay, 97% of those top managers uh, spent at least three years in the bottom half of performance. 79% spent at least three years in the bottom quartile of performance. And uh, almost half, 47%, spent at least three years in the bottom 10% of performance. So you know all their investors left if they did that, but these are the ones who ended up with the best long-term record. Most people leave them. Most people don't stick around uh, for long enough. Uh, one other thing I write up was the top, uh, in the decade of the 2000s, you know, that 10-year period, the top performing mutual fund was up 18% a year. Uh, the average investor in that fund lost 11% a year. That was the best one. Uh, why is that? It's because every time the fund uh, underperformed, people left. Every time the market went down, people left. Every time it outperformed, people piled in right after the outperformance. Right after the market went up, people piled in. So with all the investors' market decision, the average investor, the you know, average dollar-weighted investor in that fund over the last decade, the best fund, ended up losing 11% a year. You uh, make the point that if you go for value, and we'll define your definition of value in one second, uh, over the last 10 years, six, 700 basis points above the S&P. Are you guilty of rearview mirror investing, saying what worked in the past will work in the future? We know with money managers that doesn't work. Right. Well, if I had uh, spun the computer a million times to figure out what might have worked, uh, th that is true. But uh, we have a couple simple factors that we use. Uh, that's the way I invest in individual stocks. It's really looking at how much cash flow do I get for the price I'm paying. I don't use uh, simple earnings. I use our own definition of cash flow. I don't use simple price. I, I use something called enterprise value that we make all kinds of so, adjustments uh, for uh, debt. Uh, let's go to that. Uh, uh, define what you call price to cash flow. Well, uh, in, in the last book I wrote, I used EBIT, earnings before interest in taxes. Uh, for our mu new mutual funds, we actually go figure out what the real free cash flow is. EBIT is, it was a proxy, and it worked quite well in back testing. We actually uh, do the work ourselves and figure out what real free cash flow is. So if 
we have pension liabilities or tax assets and tax liabilities. Right. We just really pick it apart. But the concept is very simple. It's, you know, what is the real free cash flow of this business? And we're not looking forward. We actually look backwards. So we can talk about that in a second. You know, how can you make money by looking backwards? Because the value of a company comes from its earnings going forward. So if you have something that you can look at history, right? Reading history books shouldn't be able to make you money. Well, uh, here we're just using simple factors based on what's already happened. And, and we can talk about in a second why that works. But we're looking at trailing free cash flow to the price we're paying, the all-in price we're paying, including all the liabilities uh, of a company. And the other thing we use in the mutual funds is really just our definition of return on tangible capital. And if you read through all of Warren Buffett's letters, he really focuses very keenly on uh, how good a business it is. And one of the factors that he looks at, uh, most importantly, is a business that can, can earn high returns on tangible capital. Explain why uh, looking at the past is predictive of the future, and then get to the number of securities you should hold. Or for first, uh, why is the past predicting the future? Right. Uh, that's actually a wonderful question, and and and, uh, and and you know, frankly, a very logical and obvious question to ask. How can you look backwards and then figure out what's going to happen in the future? And in fact, we're really not doing that. Uh, what happens, uh, we were talking about before, is how people have a very short-term horizon. And, you know, the big secret for the small investor is that they can keep a long-term horizon. So uh, why would the market allow us to buy a company cheap relative to its earnings? We called it an earnings yield. In other words, why would we get a 15% earnings yield from one company and only 5% for another? Why is the market giving us this bargain? Uh, generally, the companies, if you look backwards, that earned a 15% earnings yield, most people don't think that'll continue in the future. The, at least the next year or two won't be as good as their most recent past. And so they're willing to sell it to you cheap relative to its past earnings. Uh, and uh, so they think the next one year or two will be down from where it is. So they allow you to buy it at a, bar uh, a bargain relative to past earnings. So these are out of, you're buying all out of favor companies. They earn high returns on capital. You're getting a high earnings yield, but people are worried about the next year or two that they won't be as good. So they discount. So Obamacare comes along, dump the health care stocks. Exactly. That's a, a perfect example. Uh, you know, health care stocks show up on our list now because everyone's worried about what's going to happen, you know, under uh, Obamacare. Uh, all kinds, you know, we have a company called GameStop that keeps coming up on our list because everyone thinks it's the next blockbuster. They sell so, games. So look at the videos. news and companies that uh, look like they're going to get a hit. Well, we really, do it by the, we, we really do it by the numbers. So, so uh, if you get a high earnings yield now, that means there are very low expectations for the companies that you're buying. Even though they're getting high earnings yields, there's low expectations for the future. So you're not so if they do a company a that's going broke. Exactly. You get high free cash flow now. You think the next year or two might not be as good, or there's a lot of uncertainty. So you buy them with low expectations built in. And if they do a little better or a lot better, you have the chance for asymmetric returns on the upside. And those are precisely the stocks that institutional managers who worry about doing well in the next year or two systematically avoid and overcompensate for that because they don't want to be there. So if there's uncertainty about, uncertainty about the business or you kind of know it's not going to be as good in the next year or two, uh, institutional investors systematically avoid those stocks. You don't pay a lot for anything. So if they do a little better or a lot better, you have a chance for asymmetric returns. If you... If you have, if the low expectations come in, you didn't pay for high expectations. So hopefully you don't lose very much. So if you don't lose very much on the companies where the good news doesn't get a little bit, you know, the news doesn't get a little better than expectations, and you make a lot on the companies where it's a little better or a lot better, you know, on a surprise, you can end up making a lot of money. And, and, it, and it's very systematic. And those factors have actually gotten stronger because of the institutional bias now in the market. Now, as you know, sometimes even though you do brilliant analysis, the stock can still... Uh become a dog and stay a dog, yet you say you get a better return with a handful of, relatively handful of securities, 20 to 30, yet you also have a fund where you can offer much more, but you get less of a yield. Why, why would 20 or 30 do better than, say, 500? Okay, well, um, what we really think of as underwriting this systematic risk that people are avoiding the stock. So if you insure 1,000 lives next year, uh, you probably could take a pretty good guess at about, you know, just pick a number, 6% aren't going to make it through the following year, and you can underwrite that risk. It might be 5.8%, it might be 6.3%, but you can pretty well guess what that number is going to be. Uh, when you underwrite 100 lives, you know, one or two guys going one way or the other could give you a, a different uh, outlook. Now, over a 10-year period, 
that, and, and you can actually do a little better underwriting with those 100 lives. You know, you can not insure some and insure others and maybe do, but still, two or three or four people going the wrong way in any particular year can really change your results and your expectations. So we look at it the same way uh, as uh, stock investing. You, with a more concentrated portfolio, over time, you can probably make two or three points more a year. But you probably have to wait around five or ten years for those extra two, three points. And in the interim, it's going to be a very volatile ride. We can actually do it uh, with 500 or 800 stocks with much less volatility. We do two or three points less, still beating the market by six or 700 basis points a year. Uh, but the key is, what will you stick with? Most people uh, can't live with the volatility. When they underperform for a year or two, they leave. So if you know yourself and you truly have a 10-year horizon, it, it may be a better bet to take the more selected portfolio. We actually have a mutual fund that has a more selected approach. But it's really for people who are a little bit braver meaning they understand what we're doing. We're buying above average companies, but only when they're available below average prices, and that makes sense to them, and they're willing to stick it out for five or 10 years. Most people aren't like that. Most people uh, would rather have a, a bit of a smoother ride, give up a point or two in return, still with excellent returns, and, and take a, a, a more diversified approach. So uh, there's something for everybody. They both make sense. The trade-off between the extra risk you're taking, which I don't know. So even you, you have... Uh four relatively new funds today, uh, one in effect your version of a domestic index, your version of an international index. Somebody said that's not index, that's quanting. You say you don't care, it's, it's, the, it's the principle that counts. You have two other funds that uh, are more of a roller coaster or could be more of a roller coaster. Uh, a little bit more of a roller coaster, uh, but yes, they, they have between 75 and 100 stocks in general. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have uh, you know, international and domestic index-like funds, and then we have international and domestic more select funds with 75 to 100 stocks in general. And uh, you make the point that at least uh, last thing I read was your domestic is doing better than the market, your international is underperforming, and you say, well, that's what the real world is like. You can have periods of underperformance. Uh, that's exactly uh, how it works. If, it always, if, if we had a strategy, and I wrote books about it, that worked every day and every month and every year. Bernie uh, Madoff. <laughs> exactly. Everyone would do it, and everyone did do it, and it's not real. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. So we're, taking, uh, we're, taking, we're long-term investing. It doesn't work every day, every month, and every year. Most people can't stick with it. I totally admit that. Um, but that's why it works. Uh, and so what I spend my time doing in the books is explaining why it works. Now, uh, the last time we met, you said your way of trying to get value does not work with financials and utilities. You think you've found a way to do those two industries now? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Uh, we, we did, uh, for our indexes, we do now include uh, both utilities and financials. We developed a, a, our own uh, methodology for valuing those, and we insert them into our uh, broad indexes uh, for the company. So both the uh, so the domestic index does include financials and utilities. We do not include financials and uh, still internationally because of all the different standards where banks are regulated all across the globe, and there is some trickiness to the black box nature of uh, what, what is exactly in those bank portfolios that we don't feel comfortable internationally doing yet. Uh, that's another project for down the road. But domestically, we feel very good about the regulatory. Um, now, are international statistics other than uh, financials something you can rely on now? That's uh, also a very good question. I appreciate you asking it. We, we, uh, the, uh, there are many databases that uh, that purport to uh, follow international companies. We've looked at them all. We are not comfortable using any of them. Uh, the, the data is not anywhere nearly as good as what's available domestically. And we do our own database domestically also. But internationally, it's almost impossible to invest with the commercially available data. And so we ended up putting together an investment team that actually created our own database for international. And we've homogenized 26 uh, countries now uh, with the way that we look at cash flow, the way with, that we look at valuation of companies and, and returns on capital. And, and we do that work ourselves. And so I think that's something very unique. And even though uh, our select international is underperforming, our, our index is, is performing in line with the index, we think over the long term, we've only been doing it for about six months, we think over the long term, which I mean at least four or five years, we should have extraordinary outperformance. That's what our hope is anyway. 
any prospect of ETFs? Uh, we, we've thought about ETFs, and there's actually some nice tax advantages for individual investors in ETFs. The problem with it is, is that you have to post your uh, portfolio on a daily basis. And we're doing a lot of proprietary work uh, on our database uh, and our factors uh, that we think add value over time. And so we don't want to give those away to the rest of the world by posting our, our trades and our uh, portfolios on a daily basis. So if you really think that you can add value, uh, unfortunately, the way ETFs are structured now, you don't want to really be giving that away to the rest of the world, uh, especially if you think what you have is, is, is really excellent. So while we would like to do ETFs, and, and there are some nice tax advantages for individuals, we can't. So we try to be as tax efficient as we can in our other strategies, but not quite as good as an ETF, but those are the reasons. I don't think we'd have the outperformance if we posted the ETF. Now, uh, in your world of indexing, you have... Uh relatively high fees was about one and a quarter percent versus 17 or 18 basis points with a Vanguard. Your turnover would be higher too, wouldn't it, or, or not? Right. Well, you know, I spent about seven or eight pages in, in the latest book, The Big Secret for the Small Investor, saying, well, is this real, is what we put together really an index or is it a, uh, you know, an actively traded strategy? And it was a lot of on one hand on the other. Uh, we have uh, 800 to 1,000 stocks in what we call our value-weighted index. So in that sense, and it has more diversity, and actually it's more widely distributed uh, than, let's say, the S&P 500, where the top 20 stocks in the S&P 500 can be 33% of your index. We're much more diversified than that. So in that sense, it's closer to an index. It is 800 to 1,000 stocks. It has the same beta as an index. It has the same volatility as all the other indexes. So in that sense, it's also similar to an index. But indexes have very low turnover in general. Uh, the reason for that is if you have a market cap weighted index, is they actually change every day because market prices change every day of all the constituents. You just don't have to trade to get there. You don't have to trade to get those different weightings in the stocks. They happen automatically as the stock price moves. Uh, but, but with you, us, but you, you have to look at the value of the stock each day. When we're exactly, we're looking at value, so we do have to trade. Uh, so if you, for a million dollar portfolio, we do about three to four thousand dollars worth of trading per day, which adds up to about seventy five to one hundred percent turnover, which is a little less than most active funds, but still a lot of turnover relative to indexes. So in that sense, it's closer to an active fund. So in effect, you recalibrate each day. We do. Uh, we could recalibrate every quarter. You know, in other words, there's something called the Russell 1000 Value Index. And what that index does, and, and that's a, a very well-known value index, uh, but they do something different than us. They first, out of the 1000 stocks in the Russell 1000, which are the largest 1000 companies according to market cap, they pick the 650 that have certain value attributes that they look at, like low price book, low price sales, you know, standard uh, value characteristics. So they pick the 650 out of the 1,000 that have the best value characteristics, and then they market cap weight them. So they sort of do something that makes some sense, and then they do something that I think detracts significantly from the returns that you can have by market cap weighting that value index. Uh, so we could do something similar by staying true to our value weighting criteria and update quarterly, which is or every six months. But we find that by, because prices change every day and because uh, earnings change every quarter and uh, balance sheet information changes every quarter, we could update uh, you know, every three months or every six months, but we make more money by updating a little bit every day. And that was our goal to actually uh, make not Make more money for the investor, right? Right. Our goal was to make money. Uh, you know, so we kept our eye on, on that goal. Uh, and that's the best thing we could do for investors. And that's how we went about putting it together. Uh, you've said business schools, other than Columbia, where you're an adjunct professor, ignore value investing. Is that true? Uh, to a large degree, that is true. They still they, uh, the most other schools don't teach Benjamin Graham. Uh, most business schools do not really teach Benjamin Graham. There are a few around the country that do, uh, but for the most case, uh, people are still. Uh, uh, being taught the efficient market model and uh, and all the uh, the math that goes along with that, uh, we have found we kind of feel the way Warren Buffett does is uh, you know that's good news for us that uh, you know if, if everyone's told you can't beat the market and you know this is the way to go about investing and it makes no sense to you and everyone's being taught that it, it gives a little more to uh, little little more opportunity to value investors if you have less competition. 
actually doing the work. So I think uh, I constantly get emails and, and letters from business students all over who have been exposed to Benjamin Graham. And let me just say one thing uh, to thank you and your dad. Uh, the way I got involved in value investing in the first place was from an article back in the late 70s in Forbes magazine that detailed uh, uh, Benjamin Graham's uh, formula for beating the market. You know, Benjamin Graham was Warren right. Buffett's teacher, and uh, he had uh, a nice formula. And uh, I read that article. Uh, I guess it's 30-something years ago, and a light bulb went off in my head, and I said, this makes total sense. And I read everything that Benjamin Graham ever wrote as a result of that article in Forbes, and it ended up uh, changing my life and uh, changing my way of looking at the world and changing my way of looking at how to invest. And so uh, it was a meaningful uh, turning point in, in my studies. And I was at a business school. I was at Wharton Business School. And we were learning still efficient markets, and they're still teaching the same thing over there. Uh, but, you know, it was a little article in Forbes that, that kind of uh, put me on the right path, I think. On that note, I think uh, I'll say thank you, Joel, and uh, viewers and uh, unique visitors. Keep that in mind. Thank we you. We will make you rich. Oops, the SEC is coming after me. Joel, thank you very Pleasure. much. Pleasure.